want to make you smile whenever you're sad. Carry you around when your arthritis gets bad. Oh, all I want to do is grow old with you. You know that song? Yeah. I'll get you medicine when your tummy aches. Build you a fire if the furnace breaks. So oh, it would be so nice growing old with you. I never believed in things that I couldn't see. I said if I can't feel it, how could it be? No, no magic could happen to me. And then I saw you. I couldn't believe it. You took my heart. I couldn't achieve it. That's all I got right now. That's it. That's perfect. That man. is a good icebreaker. That's uh, <laughs> that's You Can Do Magic by America, by the way. Unreal song. There we go. Uh, that wasn't so rock. difficult. Yeah, and we legitimately get every guest to sing, man. It's good. Well, I think it like it really breaks the ice. It just breaks. You can't the do ice. something more nerve wracking after that. We have no budget for a show tune of some sort yeah. or some sort of cam music. Or I, something I, like that. I love when the guests do do a rap song, and, yeah. and it's <laughs> the first couple of times I listened, I was like, "What the hell is this guy what talking about?" And I'm like, that? "Wait, why does that sound familiar?" I know, eh? but they just bastardize it. <laughs> <laughs> well, I just killed America, right? And there, you're just so. being nice about it. That's yeah. all it is, gentlemen. Welcome to the show. Thanks, Thanks for having thank us. You. Thanks for having like being on the show. I'm I'm excited about this conversation, right? So we got Nick and Dan here from uh you want to go the Canadian Real Estate Investor. Uh sorry, the Cra- Canadian Real Estate Investor Podcast. Yes, sir. Yeah. How long have you guys been doing your show for? This is month number nine. We we did a podcast for probably another nine to twelve months before that, but we had a great opportunity to relaunch under this new brand under a kind of new cadence and, and really got to reinvent ourselves. So nine months doing this and it's been awesome. You guys love doing it. A lot love of work, it. huh? Yeah. Probably, <laughs> probably not as much as you're putting in though. I mean, like what you're, what you were saying, if you get to a, an, a daily episode or whatever it is, it's, it's hard. It's a yeah. lot of work, but I, is, I, yeah. I thoroughly enjoy the conversations, man. Yeah. yeah. That's all well, unfortunately saying. Dan and I spend most of our time talking to each other on the podcast. Yeah. We don't, so we don't get starts. to interview. Yeah. <laughs> no, I mean, I think the big thing is it's like a research based podcast. So it's really like, uh, you know, creating value on specific topics for real estate investors in Canada. And so a lot of it's research driven and it takes us a little while to come up with each episode. Like it's almost like writing a curriculum, right? So yeah, I can imagine. That's right. So there's got to be a lot of homework. Yeah, attached yeah. To there's it. a lot. For Every sure. episode, yeah, like, whether it's like an evergreen one, like the fundamentals of real estate investing or, you know, the 10 step process to buying your first investment uh, property or ongoing news that we, you know, take and dissect from a bunch of different places. It's each episode, there's minimum hour or hours yeah. of work that goes into it. Yeah. Yeah, see, me, it's just the 15 years I've been in construction, and then I just get people on the show that I want to know more about, and then I ask them a bunch of questions. How do I do this? And I take it to my own jobs. Love it. Well, they're happy to do, be right? here. So, you know, they're happy to be here, and they're sharing all this information. On or off the mic, they share it, which I love, right? So I get a lot of insider stuff that I can't share later on on the mic, but I still have the information. Let me share the information here, guys. So emails to reach you guys is nick.hill at landbankadvisors.ca and Daniel, you're Daniel dot at Foch. Foch, yeah. Foch, right? It's uh, F-O-C-H at landbankadvisors.ca and then social to reach out to them is uh, at my buddy Nick 89 and then also my buddy Nick and then Daniel Foch and then at Daniel hyphenated Foch, right? Yeah. So, uh, quick shout out. I got Chris's T on. He says it's an extra large, but this feels like it's a triple X. It's just unless I've shrunk in with my age. But thanks so much, Chris, for the Richardson shirt. I really appreciate it. It's actually a nice blue. I like it. Uh, nice Carhartt. Yeah. Uh, it's Carhartt. He's got attached to Carhartt as well, too. Of right? So you gotta. I feel like I'm in the movie town, man. I'm just gonna rob something now. It's just <laughs> Carhartt everywhere. Bostonians there. They listen. They like it. It's all good, man. Uh, what else? I wanted to share something else with you guys as well, too. It's just a little bit of construction information that I was always sharing. So Simon, thank you so much for um, sharing this information because we've uh, had plenty of conversations regarding wiring and how I feel that if you're a homeowner and you're getting um, hiring someone to do work and you're getting the permit, you should have a different fee structure, which he actually reminded me that there is a different fee structure. So, for example, in 2022, wiring fee guide. If you're a contractor for a service of a 280 amp panel, it's $223. If you're a homeowner, it's 500 bucks. So I love that it's twice the price, right? Uh, 200 to 400 amp is 322 for contractor, 653 for non-contractor. So there is a fee structure regarding all this stuff, and I'm really glad that they do that. And then he also reminded me that the ESA does public or does publish um, electricians that mess up. 
do illegal work. Their names, their businesses, and the fines that were attached to them, and what they paid, and all this other stuff. So it is on the website. I was questioning that, and he brought it up. So Simon, thanks so much for doing that. Where do you guys want to begin this conversation? Because I love what you guys are saying when we were chatting yeah, before. Yeah. Every contractor that I know, every tradesperson that I know, and even off mic before we got started, you need a side hustle. You need some side yeah. income. Like I, in construction, we have a plateau. Mm -hmm. You can have so many days, so many jobs, so many projects, so yeah. many whatever. You're only ever going to make X amount of money. Yeah. And the only way you increase that number is by doing something on the side. Right. Which is where you guys are the number one regarding that something <coughs> on the side. Yeah, I would say so. Like, I think real estate investing is probably the best, most surefire way for people to, to make money. As a, I would call it a side hustle. I wouldn't call it like a passive investment. A lot of people think real estate's passive, but it's, it's not. Being a landlord is certainly a job. Um, but I think especially for people in the trades, people in the, cons in, in the construction industry, there's immense opportunity for those people to do well as real estate investors. Yeah. And it's through either adding value to properties, right? Um, increasing rents because in, in Ontario, you're capped at what you can increase a rent. You can only increase rent by two and a half percent, right? This year, um, basically they, they index it to inflation. But if you are, are doing real capital expenditures to a property, so like things beyond cosmetic upgrades, you can apply for what's called an above guideline increase. And that allows you to increase rents beyond a certain amount because you've made substantial changes. How much to the more can you increase it? Well, you have to go and apply and the, and the courts will give you an amount that you're able to, to increase it by. Okay. So you would say, I want to increase it by 10 or 20%. And then they would might come back and say, I think there is a limit. I think it's like eight and a half or 10%. Mm. Um, Rent's but, getting high. Huh? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it's crazy right now. Yeah. Like year, year over year. Uh, double digit increases in most cities in Canada. Yep. Um, and in, in the States they're coming down uh, for the past three months, rents have been coming down, but, um, but still, I mean, yeah, it's just nuts. And a lot of that is because interest rates are so high and pu it's pushing people out of ownership. Um, so yeah, I want to talk like maybe broadly about how people in the construction industry can use real estate to build wealth within their business. Like we're seeing a lot of people buying their, their um, commercial condos, running their business out of a commercial condo or buying a piece of land that they run their yard out of. Um, and we, you know, both Nick and I have represented a lot of people who are self-employed. I'm, I'm a realtor, a real estate broker, and he's a, a mortgage broker or mortgage agent. And, uh, and it's, it's difficult for a lot of people in the construction space, skilled trade. We're entrepreneurs, right? We're earning income on our own. It's difficult for a lot of them to get mortgages. So I want to talk a little bit about that. Yep. Talk about how to, you know, use business credit to go buy property, to expand your business and then build wealth within your business. So that's an easy thing to do. Not easy, but it's worth it. So that's an option on the table. Yeah, for sure. Yeah, you want to start there? We can. Well, we can start wherever you guys want yeah. to start. But I know there's going to be a lot of questions, and yeah. and then they're going to be asking all these questions too, right? Yeah. So, so, so the first, the place that I would recommend people go is to BDC, the Business Development Bank of Canada. If you just Google it, go through their website. We've done an episode on this. Um, they their mandate is to help Canadian businesses grow. So if you run a business, you can go to them and you can get a loan for to expand your business. In a lot of cases, you can get a loan to buy property. If, as long as it's related to your business, you can get a loan to buy property uh, up to 100% loan to value. Yeah. Really? Yeah. Because their How mandate... How strict are they? Uh, I mean, they're pretty lenient if the, if the business case makes sense. Like, they're not going to go let you make a bad investment or buy something that's completely unrelated to your business. But like... They will, and it says that right on their website. Like most people just don't know about this stuff. So, so you know, construction. We're famous for not making so much money on paper for a reason. Yeah. Does that help or hurt us? I guess it depends on on when when you say not making so much money. If it means, and I'll let Nick kind of answer a lot of this how it works on the mortgage underwriting side. But if it if it's you're doing a lot of tax deductions, so your gross income was maybe. 300 or 500,000 and you wrote it down to 100k to pay less tax or if the reason is because it's both right it's because of cash because right. anybody in construction if you're legitimate and you're doing a good job mm -hmm. i've told this over and over uh i personally have never done it but it's not the smart way to do it i've right. always done by the books but yeah. the majority of people in the construction industry are doing splits where right. a percentage of it is a cash and they're yeah. being paid back cash but then now the banks have no idea that that money was or income yeah i mean we see this all the time and, and dan and i work with a number of different contractors and a number of different markets my my career started off in construction um so again love it go all the way back but it's one of those things we see on the mortgage side and not just in construction and anyone that's, that's an entrepreneur that has their own business where there's the ability to, you know, get a little bit of money that, that is not going to be accounted for. 
Then when they come to get, to get a mortgage from me, and I'm literally dealing with two clients like this right now, this one lovely lady will just say very high level without getting into any specifics, has a few other kind of part-time gigs. She consults on one thing. She runs another little business here, but she doesn't make enough money to really claim anything. So she's like, well, I'm making X amount of number of dollars more a year. I'm like, okay, well, that's great. Can we prove it? No. Okay, well, then it doesn't matter whatsoever. Technically, it doesn't exist. So, you know, and but even to go further back to go what we were talking about before we uh, jumped on here, um, you know, the, the multiple streams of income and, and the side hustles and whatnot, I, I think that's such a huge thing. You know, we talk to real estate investors all the time. A lot of the people we speak to are pre-investment, trying to get to that first investment property. Okay. The number one question is always, okay, well, you know, how much money do I need? How do I get into it? Where do I find the money? How do you spend your time, you know, in that time? Okay, well, there's, there's two options. One, you go figure out how to make more money and simultaneously learn as much as you can about finding deals, analyzing deals, bringing, bringing those deals to the right people. Um, or you go and find a joint venture partner or you sit around and wait. But literally like everyone out there right now, especially in this economy, especially if you want to be an, an investor, an active investor is you need to figure out a way to make more money. And, you know, luckily we've been able to do that because we haven't taken the, a traditional path, real estate agent, mortgage agent, um, the podcast generates revenue, a referral business generates revenue, the income properties generate revenue. But every day, Everybody should be doing this. Yeah. Every, yeah. I mean, just like, what is it? The average millionaire has like seven streams of income. Exactly. So, so literally just, and like the, the thing with people is again, there, there'll be people out there listening to this. That'll be like, okay, well I want to be like those guys. And you know, I want, I want uh, multiple streams of income. I never had multiple streams of income like that. It, it took time to get here and it took a lot of work to get here. And you know, you add one and it, you know, even if it's making another couple hundred dollars a month, that's still, you're making an incremental difference, right? And that adds up. So that would be my main piece of advice to anyone listening is figure out more ways you can make more money. Um, off of what you're already generating. Off of what you're already generating, but like, you know, and that can be outside people. There's so many people that have interesting skills now, and there's so many ways to make money, whether online or, or using a skill or buying a piece of equipment, like go buy a power washer and start power washing shit on the weekends. Yeah. You know, it doesn't have to be, I'm building an app or I'm creating a course or anything like that. It's simple stuff. I mean, you know, when I was yeah, like, I, I rent a dump trailer. Out. Literally, Dan rent, Dan <laughs> yeah, rents a dump trailer. Dump trailer yeah. I got jet skis I rent out. Like. <laughs> like when I first started years and years ago, and I'm a university and college educator, when I first started years ago, and this is for a mutual partner of ours as well, like I was going and doing random landscaping jobs on, on the weekend just to get any little source of income I could to take that money to put into my investments. I was still buying property, but, you know, it doesn't have to be glamorous. It just has to be income generating a quarter is still a quarter you yeah. add a hundred quarters you start adding exactly yeah, nobody adding. nobody ever went broke making a dollar right no no i think it's interesting for trades too like you know one of the popular ways that we see people in construction make money is through flipping properties obviously mm -hmm. right i mean yes. that's kind of the low-hanging fruit it's not passive by any means it's probably the least passive way to make money on property but challenging these days though it is you really got to know your entry and exit yeah um and there is a lot of risk but then the other piece of the puzzle though is like okay for the people who are making who, who are doing the most of their business cash and and let's just say they're not going to be subject to the mortgage advice that nick's going to give for trades people um because that the money doesn't exist on paper and they probably don't want it to. So, but somebody like that could, if they can't convince a bank that they are credit worthy, that they, that they deserve a mortgage for however much money, maybe they could go and convince some owner of a teardown cottage in the middle of nowhere that they're credit worthy and that that person should give them a vendor take back mortgage, which is basically where that, you know, you have a cottage up in the middle of nowhere. It's a teardown. Nobody's lived in it for a hundred years or 50 years, whatever it's about to fall down. Um, the bank's not going to lend money on that anyway. No. So I've got, I've got uh, me and this property have the same problem. Uh, if I'm this cash, bu cash buyer, um, the, the property can't hold a mortgage and I can't hold a mortgage. So why don't, if the bank's not going to touch either of us, why don't I connect with this owner and say, look, I'll buy your cottage. You just lend me the, the value of the property. I'll give you 200 grand for it. I'll give you 20 K today and I'll give you the rest in monthly payments over the next five years. On there's whatever interest rate you choose. There's people out there that do this? Vendor take backs well, are extremely common. We've literally got three going on right now and really? three deals yeah, that we yeah. have. And, yeah. and honestly, from a real estate investing standpoint, a lot of the investors that we work with, this is one of the first things that we always pitch them. Go see if you can get a vendor take back because it circumvents a whole bunch of the BS that you have to, you have to yeah. deal with with the bank. And not even just the bank, but... 
lenders, credit unions, and even private lenders where you'd be paying double digits, like you can get great terms on vendor take back mortgages. So, so you get, so like I would say the kind of guy who's probably doing most of his jobs cash doesn't want the banks to see it. Um, he's probably going to have a pretty easy time convincing some old beauty with a cottage or, you know, a tear down house. It's just sitting there. Yeah. yeah. And he's like, Hey, like, let me fix this thing up for you. And, and then I'll like, let me buy this off you. I'll pay you when I sell it. Right. Yeah. You know, let me go. I'll do the permits. I'll do whatever. I'll do all the work. And you're basically rebuilding a house, but you don't have to pay development charges. Because when you're renovating, you, you save money right off the bat. You could com- basically completely rebuild a house. It's more attractive to them now, eh? For sure. Well, there's a lot of reasons it would be. Like, if it's just sitting there, that's not the person's primary residence, which means that if they sell it, they're going to have to pay capital gains on it. Yeah. If somebody does a vendor take back, they can actually defer capital gains or spread that capital gain out over five years. It's a, it's like a, and it's totally allowable. That's a tax strategy. Really, yeah. 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 So if anything, we've well, another pitch that we've done for some elder people trying to get out of the real estate game and retire, for instance, that want to sell all their properties at once. We've actually, we, we just, I think we're closing on this in the next couple of weeks. Um, this one gentleman was like, well, no, I just, I'm going to take all my money out and put it in dividend stocks. We're like this is a dividend stock. Mm-hmm. So just, just work with us. And we, and you know, once we explained it to him, it became a lot easier. And then, you know, the trades guys, I think anyone, especially if you're a younger person in trades, you've got such an opportunity right now. You are so, so needed in so many ways. I know a few guys in, in Peterborough, these two young brothers, the Hicks brothers, I hope these guys are listening. I'll send them the episode. Sure. Plumber and electrician. They're both probably in their mid twenties. These guys get so much work because every other investor needs them and wants them because they know how to do it from yep. an investor standpoint, yep. right? I'm not saying investor, quote unquote, cutting corners or anything like that, but you're not building builder's grade, but you're also not building luxury grade. You're building with different type of durable materials. Yep. And and they know the layouts to, to do, you know, they know the building code that is all for uh, like secondary suites and whatnot. These guys are absolutely crushing it. And they also now get to pull all their trades buddies in. Oh, I know a drywaller. I know a mudder. I know a taper. I know. Saves the investor the headache. Saves the investor. But now they're going investing themselves as well because they're like, why are we just doing this for other people? Well, and especially if you've got a group of like 10 buddies who are all like all sitting on cash, right? So in between the, or even like five guys, like between five trades people, you could solve a hundred percent of problems that yeah. a house might have. Right. It's Realistically. True. Yeah. yeah. And true. so if, if between those five guys, you have enough cash to buy a place, you know, and, and the worse condition the house, the better for the trades. Cause yeah. the value that they're doing that they're putting into the house right now is, is through the sweat equity. Right. Yeah. And the reality is if, if you go renovate a house and, and put it on the market, people who make money flipping, they're typically trying to charge about uh, 130% of what they spend. So, you know, a markup of $3 or yeah, I guess three dollars. Yeah, that's about so, right. Yeah. So yeah, thirty dollars on every hundred dollars that they spend. Yeah. Yes. And so, if you're a trade and you're doing that at you know your wholesale cost, mm-hmm. then I mean it's, it's well just it what you opened up deal. with, right? Like what's the difference between the customer buying it and the tradesperson yeah. buying it, right? So yeah. you add that in as well, you know. And I think this is I don't know if we want to go here right away, but like the the trades and uh, you know it's it's funny we were thinking about what we want to talk about on the way here, and we're like you know maybe the the crane index, maybe the labor shortage. Bill 23, um, I think, too. Bill right? 23. That's, so, that's the big, biggest opportunity in Canada right now, I think. So we're getting, we're getting Mike Holmes, who's, who's a personal friend, on the, on the podcast. And he's got this one great story about uh, when, you know, Mike Holmes Sr. and Jr. walking through the mall one day and there's some plumber, an electrician or something like that, and overalls doing whatever he's doing there. And as they're walking by, some other kid, his dad says, see, this is why you have to go to school so you don't end up like this guy. Meanwhile, that dad who's saying to the kid probably is making, you know, 65, 65 grand a year and struggling with his bills. And, and this trades guy is, you know, yeah, he might not have a the, suit on, but he's perception. Of it, exactly. Right? So, so th- that's what I'm getting at is we, like, I want to try to break that perception because, you know, the trades are not looked at as, as the sexy thing to do anymore. But <laughs> they, I, I feel like there's going to be a renaissance period for that because everything in Canada is pointing towards the absolute desperation for more housing. And how do we do that? We need people to build it. So we got a lot to talk about. I mean, first of all, Mike Holmes is not a fan of this show. He's not? (laughs) 
<laughs> I won't send him the episode then. <laughs> this is uh, Junior, by the way, not Senior. Well, no, even Junior's bad. Junior's got more knowledge about yoga pants than he does about construction. Okay, <laughs> that's what I will say. He doesn't know shit about construction, and so I'm not a fan of his. He's not a fan of this show. Because this is a real show about construction. So it's just, it's just funny you guys bring that up, and I'm sure that anybody who's listening, they're probably waiting for my comment about that, right? But everybody has I saw on, your eyes light up when yeah, as so, I said So anybody name. that's been on TV, on HGTV, isn't a fan of this show. So that's why I like having legitimate people on the show because this is the real version of construction, right? So Mike Holmes, the dad, he was a contractor at the very beginning and he was about the industry and all this other shit. But then the monetary side of things came along, right? Mm -hmm. The sponsorships and all that stuff come along. But uh, Junior never went to school. And it's a fact that Junior has never submitted an estimate to a single client ever in his life. He's never been rejected by a client. He's never been taken advantage by a client. He's never been through any of the shit that a regular contractor has been through. So that's why there's no respect for me on this side of the table for that individual, right? And so it, it's, this is all public knowledge. It's fucking, <laughs> it's just how I am, right? And I'm I don't not give a shit I'm not it. personally offended. This is just, <laughs> no. this is really entertaining. But it's just funny that you brought it up. But, it, but I agree with you about how the stigma. And, yeah. and I think that you're 100% you're right that there's a lot of young people getting into trades that are missing opportunities. Mm -hmm. they've, they've spent far less on their schooling to get into trades, whether they actually went to a trade school and learned from there and then got into the trades. So they probably only spent maybe 20 grand on their if, schooling. If that, yeah. But they paid that off in their first year of construction working. Or right? as an apprentice, you Even still get paid as an apprentice, exactly, right? Exactly, right. Yeah. So th that's far less than going to school and spending six figures on your schooling. Coming education. out with an arts degree or and then you're earning getting, four years yeah. Yeah. and coming out of university in debt. Then you come into a job site and, and you're already two, three years into the industry and you're already applying, legitimately applying for a mortgage. Mm hmm like that says a lot for a tradesperson who like, you know, you got that dad saying you shouldn't be like that. No, 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 no. Trades are, there's something. I just, there's a lot of corruption in the political side of trades where I'm not a fan of because a lot of things are being taken advantage of. But when I go back to the younger, they have opportunities that we didn't have when we were that age. Like when my, my dad's generation got started, they were immigrants coming here and you were making next to nothing as a laborer, as a bricklayer or whatever. And homes back then were a hundred grand and interest rates were less than 20%, just shy of less than 20%. So it's just like, it was a different model, but now it's, they have opportunities. So they could be 20, 25 years old, making 50, 60 K. If they're smart about it, have a side hustle or doing some, make money wherever you possibly can. You can have that money to buy that first property quickly. Dan, how many times have we said most of the guys, all the successful guys that we went to high school with, got their, you know, they were, they were working as a trade within a few years after graduating high school. All those guys bought their first houses. Those guys all own cars and trucks and toys, cottages. And everyone I know that went to university and I went to both college, I went to construction engineering technology at George Brown, but I had gone to university as well. And to see the difference in, in what those people were doing yeah. afterwards was, was fascinating, right? I mean, yeah, it was sexier to go to university, but you know, is it sexier afterwards when you're a young adult and you can't afford shit? No. Well, especially like the timing of our generation. Like I'm a 1991 baby. So a lot of like, you know, I guess we're like kind of the second half of the millennial generation that four years, like during that four year period, house prices like went up 25, 30%. So you started university, you could afford a house, you finish university, you can no longer afford a house. Like yeah. that gap is <laughs> could have just been what killed weird. you. But all, you my even know. Yeah, all my, all my buddies who like were in the trades like I come from a small town north of Toronto and like all my friends in my hometown are from or work in the trades they they all straight out of, out of high school got an apprenticeship bought a house within a year out of high school right maybe bought a rental property within two years if yeah. they were smart right and now they've they've probably paid their houses off by the time most of us were done university they were you know they they had a couple hundred thousand equity in their house they have a better paying job than most kids in university so yeah. I mean it is funny it's almost like a, it is a bit of a blessing for the trades industry that like that there is that stigma or like that cultural thing because it keeps the trade scarce like no if, if if there's not a lot of people wanting to enter it it means that you know if you're in the trades you can charge a lot more right i don't i, don't, I know a lot of guys argue that but i don't know if that's going to be the case i still think and i've told the guys over and over start considering other revenue streams for i've sure. always said that over and over yeah. try to figure out if you want to somehow come up with cool looking logo t-shirts or yeah. whatever swag that you, and you want to sell them somehow and yeah. all of a sudden they become something online get an etsy account dude like what you guys are saying just come up with all these anything things. and everything everyone's got ideas just no one actions always speak louder than words yeah always i love seeing tradespeople that always come up with new ideas for products yeah. so when i get 
yeah. sh- guests on the show, like we had drywall guys there and they came up with a new way to do a corner and they came up with a product that, that was from paper. And they patented it, and now they're selling it, and it's getting out there, and it's just getting started. It's just the beginning, if it's it, right? But the thing is, that's that's where you want it. So if you're a tradesperson, you've been doing electrical, plumbing, HR, whatever, there's something in your head spinning. Yeah. yeah. You, and there's you always a, there's a better way to do this. Exactly. Like, for, Okay, here's two good examples, because I love where you're going with this. So there was this thing on Dragons, and I've watched every episode of Dragons and Shark Tank, and there was this, this guy that had to put a wet paintbrush in, like, a sealable Tupperware-type clip, and it was yeah. basically built around that. I'm like... I've done a lot of painting in my day. Like, this is the simplest shit ever. How has no one thought about this? I just saw on Instagram the other day someone who invented a roller that does corners perfectly. I'm like, I have, you know how many times I've cut the whole room before and then the, and then roll. And then roll, right? So again, if you're a tradesperson, you're doing this, you know, you're, it can get a little monotonous. You're doing something, something similar most days. You're going to identify the problems in that series or sequence of events a lot faster than anyone else's. Start looking for the opportunity in that sequence of events to make it better. I agree with you guys totally. So, all right. So we're, okay, that's that side. So that everyone's got their business. And so it's possible that you're cash-based, not fully cash-based. You still have to prove that you're a good Always citizen. still make some money on paper you or you're going to be screwed in more ways than one. Kinds, right? yeah. So it's like have that and then get started from there, right? Well, yeah. And if, you, if, you're, if you're a person who can't, find, who can't get a mortgage for whatever reason, but if it's if it's because you are mostly working for cash, if you're that type of person, go find a property that also can't get a mortgage. Like it, Because the reality is, especially if you're a trade, like if you can go find a tear down old cottage in some town that the bank would look at it or the bank would send an appraiser to the property and the appraiser would say, no, we're not lending on this property, Right then who else is going to buy it? Only some, either A, somebody with cash, or B, somebody who can convince the owner to lend them the property until they fix it up. Right? What's the number one thing the bank wants to hear from you? Income. That's it. Well, yeah, yeah, that, that would be the number Stable one. Stable income. Income, yeah. um, credit, and then for most, like for most mortgages in Canada, are you going to live in the property, right? Because a lot of yeah. people are buying for primary residence. Yeah. And then, like, there are two different programs, primary residence versus investment, or, f- like, there are lenders who will do flip mortgages as well, right? Yeah, we work with someone, but... I, and they we, won't, and they'll actually lend, like, without even really looking at income. It's really more relationship-based. Like, does the deal work? And so it's, uh, it's, the in, it's the ins and outs of the deal. So they'll really underwrite based on the deal and your ability to execute the deal. And your income doesn't really have that much to do with the ability to execute the deal, right? Got it. So one of the other re- one of the other ways that anyone with any kind of skilled trade or even just construction experience in general, if you can be a GC or a PM or anything like that, and you don't have the money, you've been doing a lot of it in cash, you're young, whatever, go find someone with cash and no time that wants to get involved in real estate and partner up with them. We've done deals like that too, where this property, you know, that we have to get a traditional mortgage. It's going to be a traditional deal. There's a buyer with cash, with the right credit and the right history, all that kind of stuff. And then there's someone else that comes in who's got the time and the expertise to do it. And to be honest, whether you're a plumber, an electrician, or, or whatever, you a carpenter, whatever you are in that trade, you know other trades and you can start pulling them yep. in. And you've, you've been on enough job sites to know what goes right and what goes wrong. And residential stuff, for the most part, is pretty easy. Um, so that's another thing I'd be telling any young trades person who's listening to go and if you want to get involved in real estate investing, figure out what you're good at and then go start pitching that to people that want to get involved, but don't have the time, but have the money. Are long deck boards causing you stress? Are bow wrenches wearing your crew out? There's an easier way to install your next decking and siding project. Just make Muso Bamboo Extreme Decking and Siding your next choice for a truly sustainable, durable, and uniform material. With Muso Bamboo Extreme, you can install decking and siding with less labor, less waste, increased profits. Visit www.musobamboo.com today. There's also uh, the other thing that, I mean, in my 15 years of being in construction, I'm always clients change their mind, products arrive, and they're not always the perfect product. So then it's less hassle just not to return the product. Uh, It's just easier to hang on to it. But then I quickly started realizing, hang on to that shit because it will be useful one day. And that's where you guys come in. Right. You ha- find a property and all of a sudden you've got a sink, vanity. Tiles. You got tiles, you got Toilets. all kinds, you got everything. <laughs> Just start stockpiling and all of a sure. sudden you have a lot of, and that starts to offset it. Not so much your skills, you're already offsetting it, but the material starts to offset it too, yeah. right? No, it's a, it's a great point, right? So I know in the beginning, you you just uh, you touched upon uh, the whole business side yeah. about acquiring land yeah. and buying land for yeah. your business and expanding yeah. your business, sure. right? Let's get into that world. Yeah, so m- one of the primary ways that you see people 
amass wealth through real estate is by using it for business interests. So, you know, you'll see big industrial companies build their industrial facilities as an example. Um, I think that we're going through this kind of renaissance period where there are lenders like the BDC as an example, um, Business Development Bank of Canada, who I would recommend everybody just like check Google, it out. Check it out. Um, I mean, Nick can connect you with them as well, like on a deal by more deal by deal basis, but you can also just reach out to them directly and get them to look at your business case and say, could I go buy property with this business? And they'll they'll kind of answer you yes or no. But if you're a business that you're using a yard anyway, or you're renting space or whatever it is, or an industrial space, like, you know, a lot of guys have contractor garages or, you know, whatever it is. Um, you can buy like small industrial units in most cities in the GTA for far cheaper than you could buy a house. Like it'd be like $400,000. It'd be a, it would be a condo, an industrial condo unit. But you, if you, if you require that space for your business, you can get a lender who will help you to, or they'll give you credit to buy that. Will well. it be easier to get that than actually? It'd be easier. Well, you can go buy it. So, like, Depends, like would it yes. be easier to get it than a mortgage? You mean? Yeah. Probably. Uh, it's probably about the same. It's okay. gonna be the same amount of headaches for yeah. for somebody who's self employed in the trades. Like, it's gonna be hard for them to get a traditional mortgage anyway. Um, but the the point is, like, you'd be paying rent on that facility anyway. Like, it really only makes sense if you actually need the the facility. But if you need space, like, if you need a a, a yard or a, a garage, and you could get by with like a small industrial condo, which a lot of you know, trades businesses are running out of buy it. Like the, the cost isn't going to be that much different for you. What's right? the market at like looking at for that? Is there a lot of supply? There is. Cause there's not like, it, it's still pretty scarce. Like industrial is crazy right now. Like 10 years ago, you couldn't find somebody to buy, to want to buy industrial. And right now industrial vacancy rate is, it's about the same as multifamily. So it's below 1%. So multifamily yeah. is below 1%. Um, and, and industrial is below 1% vacancy. But the thing is, when you say industrial is below 1% vacancy, that's like taking the millions of square feet, like the whole industrial universe of millions of square feet, and then how many, like taking that that small 1% of the square footage. But in these individual units, like in condos, it's not like somebody's going to go and buy that. As an, inv like an investor is not going to buy that to lease it out to somebody. Yeah. So they are really purpose-built for businesses who are buying it for end users, right? So owner-occupied. And that's what programs like the BDC, the Business Development Bank of Canada, you, they they will use the credit to help businesses expand by buying real estate. And if, if like, if it makes sense, like if you're saying, oh, I'm spending whatever, five grand a month already renting this space and I can go own it for five or six grand, like, yeah. you know, why wouldn't I do that? I guess it's, it's just where your business is at and trying to figure out where you want to grow it. And we're not like, I want to be everybody to be clear that we're not looking to tell you guys to stop construction. We're just looking at telling you guys to understand the benefits of what you can do included. Well, in make, create, create positive byproducts. Yeah. Like, why yeah, not? Exactly. Like if you're going to do it anyway, you're going to use this, this yard or you're going to use this garage. Why not? You're going to pay for it. You're going to pay a monthly payment to have that garage. Why not build equity rather than just making it a sunk cost? Yeah. yeah. Even own it at some point. And then at some point exactly. you want to retire or pass on the business and you're also selling that. And now you're making more. Exactly. Money you're you're building that. wealth or asset value into the business. So yeah. the business is worth more. So we know some business owners that, that have done this, right? They, they started renting. They realized, okay, this sunk cost, what am I doing here? They went and bought the buildings that they're operating out of. They were able to improve them much more than their existing landlord would have let them. Then they've gone and sold the businesses years later, and now they've kept the real estate and they're renting the real estate back to the person that bought that business. It's a win, win, win. It makes a lot of sense. Right? And then even on a smaller scale, right? If it's just a contractor garage or a yard, I mean, in my opinion, it's just, oh, if it, if it makes sense, it's, it's, it's worth it. Right. And it's a, it's a hard thing to, you know, put a blanket statement on cause it's very subjective for your business, where you are, right. If you're a contractor right downtown Toronto, it's probably not going to work out. But if you're a contractor, maybe somewhere in Vaughan or North of the city, Northeast, West, South of the city, whatever, I guess not South, but if anywhere, you know, in the surrounding areas, there's, there's a lot more reasonable opportunity there. It makes sense. And this, this goes for any business as well. This is if you're, you know, not just con construction, but if you're, if you're a barber, you know, go try to buy the, the, the business that you're operating out of the whole time. Now, can we talk about CRA, taxman, and just talk about benefits? I'd rather that? not. <laughs> just, <laughs> I mean, because you got to also factor that in, yeah, right? Sure. So it's like, I, I know that a lot of people about flipping and then capital yeah. gains and yeah. all, we have to be conscious of that as well too, right? Yeah, for sure. Yeah. I mean, so... Like if you're flipping a property, there's new, so it, I guess there's a couple of different ways you can use 
being in in construction to make money in real estate. But if you're flipping, you got to pay capital gains on the appreciation. Yeah. Um, they will probably eventually try and make it fully taxable at business income because they think it's you're in the business of flipping and they're probably not wrong, right? So yeah. just be w it's worth being cognizant of that. Um, <laughs> in regards to owning property for business uses, a portion of the interest will be tax deductible. I mean, it's probably an accountant question. Like I would talk to whoever yeah, does your accounting, sure. but a portion of it typically, because you, you do require that space for business activity. And then whatever retained earnings you get, you'd have to pay tax on as well. So like as you, and then, and then when you set, when you go to sell it, because it's part of the business, it would be ta like fully taxable, Based, the capital course, gains yeah. and whatever. Yeah. yeah. But if you were, okay, so let's say you were flipping a property. What if you s decided to stay in the property and you created a rental property, a rental unit in that property now? If you moved into it? Yes. You, yeah. So, so uh, the, a portion of it, so like the portion that you're renting, you pay tax on? Yes. You would pay capital gains on, yeah. And this is an interesting segue, actually, because like, eventually I do want to talk about Bill 23, which is basically where they're making it so that you can put a multiplex in any yes. house in Ontario. That's where I'm, I'm headed, yeah. Yeah, so, <laughs> but so, so like for that, um, if it's primary residence, like hypothetically should be not taxable at all, right? But a, as soon as you introduce commercial activity, you're renting it, then that portion... If, you're, if it's income generating, you should pay tax on that portion of it. Now, how does it work? Most people don't, like, to be honest with you. It's probably, like, the most common type of... Gray area. Yeah. Well, it's not. It's not. Like, the, the CRA makes it pretty clear, but most people just, like, don't report that income. Yeah, but, I mean, the CRA needs to go to optometrist, too, sometimes. Yeah, right? for sure. So it's just, yes, uh, I, but, I mean, correct me if I'm wrong, but I think that the work that you do or the material that you use is not fully... You can't use it towards a deduction or an offset to the, the expense of whatever income you're bringing in. Uh, not against the income. You can use it against the capital gain doing something what's called a CCA recapture, a capital cost allowance, Correct. which is like yeah. where they you, you add it all up and then you depreciate it and then add it back at the end. It's really complicated. But it's when you sell allowance. the property. Yeah, because like if you're doing improvements to the property, then technically they, they're like a house depreciates. So anything yes. that if you, do, if you redo the facade in stone, then that depreciates as well. So um, you, any money that you spend, you're already tax deducting it on a depreciation basis. And then whatever hasn't been depreciated, you can add in to deduct against the capital gain later. Yeah. So a lot of guys were actually reaching out and I was speaking to them and, and I found out recently too about that. I was like going, okay, I didn't realize that because a lot of guys were thinking, I'm going to do all this work. I'm going to cover a lot of expenses. I'm going to pay for all the material. I can use this to offset against towards the income. I go, no, it don't work like that. Mm -hmm. Right. It's exactly how you explained it right there. That's how it works. Yeah. Well, yeah. yeah. Cause built like, so the easiest way to think about it is like businesses have what's called property plant and equipment yeah. and, and PP and E is a house. It fits within that, right? It's a, it's property. And so it, it's depreciable. Yeah. And so that's how you yeah, did, would tax deduct it. So it's just as something to consider. It's like a car. Actually, it's the same yeah, as a car. Yeah, it's the same right? thing, right? That's exactly it. Now, is it also true? Because I had a conversation recently uh, in Canada. The CRA hasn't jumped on this yet, but there's no capital gains on uh, vehicles, cars. No. Yeah, there isn't. Well, I mean, there never, but there never there was. There never was. Well, like, but mm -hmm. no, but there would never, like, this is the first period of time where there ever was, a, where there ever was. Profit. Exactly. But America's already, so you can't, and I'm bringing this up because I had an interesting conversation. You can't buy a, a Mustang, 50-year-old Mustang, whatever, get lucky, buy it for 50 grand, and then turn around, sell it for 150 grand. And not pay capital gains. Nothing. Right, right now, it's right. nothing. But uh, they're saying that CRA is going to catch up to I this. mean, I guess there would be, I guess, like, technically there should be, it wouldn't be capital gains, but, like, you would still have to sell that as an in, as income because you're disposing of it. It's still asset. income coming into your pocket. Yeah, right? but you I, still have to pay tax on that. That's you, more than capital gains. If you did it as a cash deal, then right. that's a different story. Yeah, right? I mean, that's a whole but right now, America charges capital gains on any kind of vehicles that are sold. I think so, yeah. Uh, Canada doesn't yet. So yeah. if you've got luxury cars, you guys want to sell them, then you can... But I think you still have to pay on income, would you not? I guess yeah, not. As income, as legitimate as income, yeah. So it's actually, yeah, it'd right. be more than capital gains yeah. number, right? Yeah. It'd be 40%, whatever it is. Right? Whatever your tax bracket is. But then, because capital gains, you only pay your, your tax rate on half of the gain. So it ends up being at the top tax bracket, which typically it pushes you into the top ta tax bracket. Like assuming you're selling a house, you're making 500 grand or something. Yeah. I think it's like 26%. So are you guys a fan of the multi-level, multi-units? Yeah. Multi-family. Like multi-family. Yeah. yeah. yeah, yeah, for yeah. Sure. It's, it's basically all we do. Yeah. That's all you guys focus on. Yeah. Well, like well, I would get, I would get more into like small industrial and stuff like that. Like the, the garage properties and yards and stuff that we're talking about. But like it, I'm not the right person to get credit for that. If I was a trade, like all day long, I would bu be buying small industrial. 
all day. Like I, I actually would prefer it. It's a way less headache as an investor, right? If you can b buy or build a small industrial property and cut it up into a bunch of units, you run your business out of it and six and other tenants, six other small tenants, tenants you know, like a fabric, smart. fabricator, yeah. garage, whatever. Some fulfillment facility. Yeah. Like logistics. tons of last mile, like people running Etsy stores that need yeah. like 2000 square feet. I, I've got friends. We just drove past their warehouse right, right now. And they do, they're doing a million bucks a week in, in shipping. There's this guy on Twitter. He it's called like he they're called contractor garages and it's basically like storage but with electricity in it. It's like a storage unit but it's just like it has electrical and the guy is making like absolute bank just running these like So he's built these storage units but he's added electricity. To yeah, it. so so they're electrically serviced. No plumbing. So no plumbing. So think about it like like imagine renting to to someone like that where they're in the route, it's an easy business, they're there professionally. They come in once in the morning, once at the end of the day. Exactly. Right? Drop the, drop the so truck So technically, off. we can buy a yard of some sort and then build these storage units well, on I mean, it. It's not that easy, but like if you if you had the right zoning, yeah, you could yeah. do that. Yeah. And then also, like, and a lot of guys do it. They, they'll just buy like farms that are zoned for outdoor storage, right? Mm. And as long as you, like, the thing is you, you can't just go buy a farm and park random stuff on it. Like, especially if it's a lot of stuff. Uh, you'd need out, outdoor storage zoning for it. But I know guys who have done it. Like, I mean, even some of the big holdouts where you just see a vacant piece of land in like some of these industrial parks, like close to Toronto, where there's a just a bunch of excavators parked there. That's and like, smart. you know what I mean? And these guys are sitting on like $20, $30 million worth of real estate. So I think that trades have an opportunity to do something similar today. Yeah. And then the, and we can talk about multi, like the multifamily stuff. But if, if I... No, that makes more sense to me, man. Yeah, yeah I mean, it, it does. Like, I think it's a no-brainer. I think it's like the biggest unexploited opportunity in the market right now is that yeah. there's so much opportunity for skilled trades to buy real estate. Yeah. And it's, and it's also more of a B2B than a B2C relationship, right? Like what we're doing, we're the business, but we're buying multifamily and we're dealing with individual people, individual people with the stuff that we're buying can produce <laughs> lots of headaches, let's say. And that's what we get paid for, right? That's why we make yeah. the little bit of money that we do off them because we're dealing with the headaches. But Every, any business I've had with its B two B is always just a different level. People operate on a different level than it's a business transaction. Exactly right. Instead of like I, you know, you are renting your home from me, right? Like you've been here for years. I'm just the new landlord, whatever it is. Versus I'm pro I'm providing someone with a business, a place to run that business out of. And as long as I'm a good landlord, and again, this is what the stuff that Chip Wilson was saying, the billionaire founder of Lululemon, who who is now one of the largest. Uh, lab and what was it life sciences lab and life sciences landlords in vancouver just a really interesting niche but he he's very passionate about that side of things and it was just fascinating to hear what they were saying and what their tenants are looking for versus because they also own a bunch of multifamily down in seattle and, and the differences between those two portfolios the multifamily versus the life sciences and lab stuff you think life sciences and lab is going to be a lot more you know, pain in the ass, a lot more complicated. Well, it is, but at the end of the day, it's way more worth it than the multifamily. For us, multifamily is just less of a barrier to entry. You know, Dan's talked a lot about BDC. The the equivalent on the multifamily side would be CMHC, Canadian Mortgage and Housing Corporation. For the people in the States, it doesn't matter. For Canadians, look it up. Well, in you the don't States, know what it's it is. housing and urban development. Right, but uh, yeah. So anyways, the similar program that, that uh, provides programs and, and incentivizes people such as us to to buy multifamily and, and, you know, build more multifamily, et cetera. Do trades people have to get worried about getting too big on paper? I don't think so. I mean, like, I guess it depends on whether or not you think that Canada is like headed for a similar version of capitalism to the U S like, but, but like you think about a lot of the guys, like a lot of people think like the American dream or the Canadian dream is like home ownership. But the, the real dream, at least in the American dream is building a business that's so big that you can like IPO it or sell it for a bunch of money. So I think that if, if your business is too big, you like, that's a very good problem yeah. to have, right? <laughs> Everyone then should be striving options. for that. You have yeah. options to where you can go with it. Right. Away from it. Right. Yeah, no. Okay. I'm just trying to figure out because you get a little bit of that intimidation in trades people wondering, I don't want to be that big. Right. Well, the, it's like, just like real estate. It's like, if you're building a portfolio, it's not, real estate doesn't kill people. Running a business isn't a bad investment. Never, right. never a bad so. investment. Real estate is not a bad investment. The bad part about those two things is when you scale and you scale quickly, you often use leverage. Debt is what kills people nine times out of 10, right? Yeah, very, very true. And just to add to that, I mean, not like the debt piece for sure, that's, that's the number one killer. The other thing is people trying to do everything themselves. If you're growing and, and you can't figure out who to bring on, and this is literally a conversation we had 
he, on the way here because we've got some businesses that, go, that are growing pretty quickly. We are already working too much. How do we bring in the right people to handle those business? How do we silo off those people? And, you know, that's that's your job now. You come in and tell us what you need from us, right? You create those people through that who, not how mentality. So bring those people on. And if that's the case and you've got the right people around you, then hell yeah, keep growing. Why wouldn't you want to? I agree with you 100%. The problem is you're dealing with trades people that think that they can do everything. Right. <laughs> this, come, come, to come to the real estate Come to the real estate world. It's the same, same thing. Same thing, right? Yeah. 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 So, I mean, that, that's it's just, just a, a mindset. You have to look at it. For sure. And it's a long game too, right? Yeah. You can't, if you if you go down this path, you have to start thinking about this long game. What is it? And I've told people, you're in your 20s, start thinking about your exit plan. Right. Right? Because you have a perishable career, right? You can only do so many swinging of the hammer for so many years before you start having physical problems, right? Exactly. So you have to start thinking about, how do I get out of this at 50? Now, when I say out of it, like you're not swinging the hammer anymore. You're probably PMing it, you're organizing it, you're branching off, franchising it, doing anything. But you're you're focusing on a pencil more than you are on a nail. Exactly. That's all I'm saying. Love so that. if you okay. can start planning that, because a lot of guys that are in their 40s and 50s didn't do that. Mm -hmm. And now they have to still work into the 60s and late into the 70s. Yeah. And they talk about... It's the passion drives me. Passion drives. Yeah, but your bones, your yeah. aches and pains. Yeah. Passion is going to drive yeah, you. Ask the your ground. joints if they feel yeah. the same passion. Right. <laughs> yeah, and the problem so. is that we're living in a society now. What is it now? You need a minimum of a million dollars to retire in Canada yeah. these days, it's, right? It's a bare minimum. Yeah. Bare well, minimum. And like yeah. what you see happening in France, like France is just like twenty years ahead of us, maybe fifty years ahead of us. Like, you think our pension system is going to survive for the millennial well, generation? I, the to be last there? show we were just doing that is like I'd, I'd, I'd love to see that happen here because well. I think construction and people in general, Canadians, will. Be just like the Parisians, man. Yeah. Well, how many how many construction guys have pensions? They don't. No one that's does. The no one in no one in real estate. So has you need pensions. a pension. You guys don't have it either. No. Anybody. That's why we buy. That's why we buy houses. That's the pension. You have there. to make your own pension. Exactly. And then that pension that they'll give you later on, which is going to be pennies, you'll be like, all right, fine, I'll get a a coffee lift with this, right? Exactly. So, it's so I mean, scary. To, my my thing to answer your question, you know, what, what like how do you go from Hammer to pencil, which I love. That's that's great. That should be a T-shirt, to be honest. Um, Take it, run with it, Etsy it. <laughs> there you go. Someone listening, I give you permission to go do that. Uh, we'll get ten percent. Um, like literally, like all of those guys that are going into, you know, even at like, so I'm a few years older than Dan. I'm 34 this year. If I was an active, if I had my own construction business, I know a couple of guys our age that, that do. And their, their main thing is I can't find the right people. I can never find the right people. I'm like, yeah, because the right people are being pulled by, it by everyone. They know they're the right people. They're charging way more. And then, you know, the wrong people still get work because there's such a shortage. There's all these programs, like the program I took like 10, 15 years ago, whatever it was, the Construction Engineering Management Program at George Brown. There's programs like that at every college. There's online programs yeah. like that. All of these guys, and, and I don't know why they never did this when I was in school. Maybe they're doing it now, but, like, there should be apprenticeships offered in each one of those. You should be going and finding, and, like, each one of those trades that are looking to find that next batch of, of young people, go and, like, bring, like, go and find them at, at those programs. Because a lot of those guys that were in those programs, some of them went off to do well in construction. Yeah. Half of them were working at Home Depot. And I'm not kidding about no, that. No, I'm not. I know. I know. It's, it's brutal. True. So you went and spent a couple of years learning and, you know, the ins and outs of construction, everything from surveying to concrete forming and, and all this good stuff. Now you're, now you're working at Home Depot selling two by fours when all you had to do was go and, and, you know, meet the right person. And that's what it all comes down to within real estate, within business is, is networking and finding the right people. And if there's no path or vehicle to do that for these young people or these middle-aged guys that are like, shit, I got like 10 more years with a hammer and then it's fully pencil or crayon, I don't even know at that point. <laughs> you know, that's like that's one of the main things. I think we need to get the younger generation and the older generation trying to figure out how to how to talk to each other. And I also think there's gonna be a lot of frustration there for the older guys that are like, this person has no idea what to do and and you know they, they need to there just needs to be a bit more synergy there and a bit more communication. I don't know how it's but it's true, like cause you're talking like Everybody talks about how there's, we're about to see like the biggest generational wealth transfer mm -hmm. in like between the baby boomer generation Four, and the millennial 400 generation. 400 billion in Canada. And like a lot of that's going to take place through real estate. Um, but another big portion is through business value. Like, you know, the number of baby boomers set to retire over the next decade is enormous. It's the biggest cohort of retirees ever to happen in Canadian history. And all of those people are going to or sorry, a good portion of those people are entrepreneurs who are just going to like either sell their businesses for nothing 
or just shut them down. Or just completely. shut them down. Which and is so horrible. like the same way we talked about the vendor take back thing where people should buy properties and try and turn the owner into the bank, make the owner lend you the money to buy that property. Similar things could be, and these happen all the time in the trades place uh, in the, or in the, in the construction industry where somebody is, you know, a junior guy at the company is taking over the business from somebody senior and they, you know, maybe give them 20% of the business residual forever. And that's the guy's retirement plan. Yeah. A lot of room for deal making to happen in that space. But that's, that's far and few that that happens. I mean, it's very for sure. rare, right? And it's usually you have to be married into it or, or actual family member yeah. at that yeah. point, right? right? If you still have the interest to do that with the baby boomers, I get that there's a generational, but the thing is that Canadians also are living longer too. Yeah, for sure. And then their children are buying or overbuying, I guess. Mm -hmm. Right. So all of a sudden they have to still factor in what they need for their remaining years. Yeah. And and then factor in how much less they can give them as a result of that stuff. So it's going to be, it's going to be an interesting change or shifting of the guard or something like that yeah. because coming I mean, to like a bottleneck situation. It is. It's going yeah. to be interesting, right? Because I mean, the last thing that any of these baby boomers want to end up is in different homes or something like that, and all of a sudden not have enough wealth to take care of themselves, right? Yeah, and that's that's one of the other major opportunities that we talk about is all these baby boomers that are moving out of the you know four or five bedroom home, three bathroom home that are now one point five million dollar plus, right? Know. You've got hundreds of thousands of these people come into an age where they're they're empty nesters they don't want those places anymore but where are they going to go right there's no homes being built there's there's not enough like detached bungalow bungalow loft whatever kind of like easy access built purpose built for boomers right that is a huge opportunity as well so someone out there listening I know, you know. It's, it's been brought up and I yeah. know that there was uh, I brought up a study in Vancouver that actually uh, an empty nester did that a retiree did that they had a triplex and they converted it into yeah. three different dwellings and then they rented it out to two other baby boomers right. Yeah, that's gonna. That I think that's the next trend to happen in Canadian housing. Sense. Like, I think the government has yeah. failed so hard at at all levels to deliver affordable housing that uh, that's never been said. Yeah, and and, and <laughs> that's um, first on this podcast, <laughs> and the I think the regular people of Canada are going to be left to solve this problem. Like the, the got, developers could have done it. The private sector could have done it, but planning takes so long. And then now we're, are, are, we have a skilled trade shortage because we're not immigrating the right people. Like we should be, we should have way more skilled trades immigrating. They want to come here and work in, Cana in the Canadian. But we're also not making our own ingrown talent here right. interested in construction. Mm -hmm. Right. For sure. No, that's it's a, true. That's so, a bigger problem too yeah, as well. Yeah, too. That is an excellent point. Um, but I think it's interesting, like with Bill 23 being proposed in, in Ontario and then in BC, they have similar things being proposed where basically they want to make it so that you can fourplex everything in, in the um, province of British, Colum British Columbia. They, they've basically made it. Doesn't matter what neighborhood? Yeah, no, it doesn't matter. Any any lot. In Ontario. And, no shit. Yeah, in Ontario, Bill 23 is basically proposing that you can duplex so you can put two units into any house that already exists in, in the province. So if, I, if you're, all of these houses that we're talking about, these because baby boomers, like the household size in Canada has been shrinking since 1963. It went from like six people on average to like just over two people on average. Like I think it's 2.4 or something. Yeah. yeah. So Same size square footage? Well, like that. No, but then we don't really know like what okay. the average square footage of a house, but the household size. So let's assume it's the same square footage. It's probably bigger because we've been building So in the 60s, it was six and yeah. now it's two. So people yeah. went from having four kids to, you know, one yeah. and a half. And the total number of people living in a house has basically been cut in half or a little bit more than half. Yeah. And so what, what this ends up with is like we have a uh, whole country that it has too much house. Like, and if you look at, there's like this study basically of, of how people use their houses and like, they only use like three, three rooms in their house other than going to their bedroom. So you have all these baby boomers who are literally one hip replacement away from <laughs> not being able to live in there. Seriously. I'm, I'm not, no, I'm not laughing at yeah, that because no, but, no it's but it's true. As yeah. you get older, you start realizing the stairs. I don't want to deal yeah. with stairs as and I'm not going to put that chair on that stair. Right. Yeah. All no, right? Exactly. Well, that's a century you know, home. I can't yeah. No, And and that is one of those things, right? Where it's like that, that's like the final piece there. Like I'll put an elevator in there before I put that <laughs> yeah, chair on yeah. that stair. Right? Yeah. The chair, the chair and kills and so it's like how, okay. So we, we're going to have, I think a surplus of all of these homes. Cause like, our generation can't afford to buy all of these four bedroom houses off of these boomers. And we're not having enough kids to either. Like there's no point. We, we don't, none of us need all of that space. So, so I think you're probably about to go through this major transition where you start seeing policy like this, where, you know, a lot of the high rise stuff. Yeah. I mean, it's only economical to build when interest rates are low when, and you're already seeing construction pull back, right? Yeah. Like we've seen 30% of projects either canceled or postponed. Um, you need a lot of foreign investment to buy all of those units. You need a lot of uh, rental growth to, to rent all of those units from the investors. 
Whereas we already have too much house, I think. And so I think we start seeing a lot of those converted. And, and to me, again, this is like when I sent you the notes, the other big opportunity that, that I think exists for people in the construction industry is converting houses to multiplexes, One, like buying. I, like, I, I totally so, agree. So if you, if you're, if you're, the two ways that as a, as somebody in the construction space, you can build wealth is buy your own industrial property or buy your own commercial property that you need to use and, and build it into the business. Or if you're multiplexing houses, like if you're buying single family homes and adding basement apartments to them or whatever, if you can do that for less than a hundred bucks a square foot, you're beating the market by like three times, yeah. probably like a br if your brand new builds, what three fifty a foot now, probably. 400 a foot? What planet are you guys on? Right, exactly. So what, <laughs> what is it, 400? Like, no, you're six to seven, man. That's construction, though. Yes. Or sorry, uh, or um, concrete, like your high rise. Yeah. Like 600 bucks a square No, 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 that's residential, custom resi, right? But that's the actual For price. Custom. That's custom, but, yeah. But yeah, custom. But if you're talking, you're a skills trace person, yeah. you're whacking that into a third. Well, I right? think the average Canadian right. is like 375 or something like that. That's na home, nas national, sure. national sure. average, though, yeah, right? That, so we're talking like Winnipeg, grade, Edmonton. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah, yeah, for sure. But, but so, so if, house already exists. If you're retrofitting it in, you can probably do it for, I don't know, 100, 150 square foot, under 200 bucks a square foot. As a trace person. Calling sure. some favors with your buddies. And and the other thing is there's, you know, there's there's strategic ways into stuff like that, right? So you can go and be a first-time home buyer. You can go and live in one of these properties, get 5% down, and then do that over the course of a year. And all of a sudden, now you've house hacked a single family home into a duplex. And then if like permits allow for you to do it, you've got a detached garage, turn that into a unit as well. Now you've been living in the same place for a year and a half you went from one units to three units. You've created a, uh, you've created more housing, but you've also created a, a liability into an asset. And then go and do it again somewhere else. Go move into another place. Keep that one as a rental property. Go move into a new primary residence. Like people Tri in the states, triplex it. Move on to the next one. Exactly. You could, if you do one of those a year for the next ten years, you got a thirty unit portfolio. Can you? I know that I was having this conversation, but I wasn't exactly sure on the the literature if I actually read all the multi. Can you just park another dwelling in the backyard of any backyard? So not yet, right? Yes. So the, yes the, no. So Bill 23 is designed to make that happen. The, te the technical answer is yes, you could do it. The, the problem is the municipalities still have the power to say no. You know, they, yeah. Now, they can't technically say no. Like if they said no, you could take them to the OMB, the Ontario Municipal Board, fight their decision, and you would win every single time. But the problem is like, and it's not even that they're, that they're like trying to um, stop housing from being created. They literally just don't even know that the rules have changed. So, so Bill 23 <laughs> so they'll is... So they'll tell you no and then hope that you go away, but then you can come back and go, well, hang on a sec. Yeah, well, you could just fight it. Like you could take... And, and so it, right now it, you can legally already put a, uh, two units into an existing dwelling and an, a garden or... Um, a garden suite. A garden suite or, or a laneway, laneway house on a, detached, on a detached on a detached property. Yeah. The problem is, and it would have to meet the Ontario building code and whatever. So you'd have to meet ingress, egress, yep. fire separation. Yep. Setbacks, um, et cetera. Yeah. But yeah, you technically you can do that. Yes. It's just like right now, is it worth it to try and get the permits from the municipality? Whereas we know that on the horizon, Bill 23 is going to come out when it does. They okay. literally, you literally just go as long and you go with your engineer drawings and say, this is stamped. It meets the criteria of, of Bill 23. Give me my permits. And then you go and do it. Whereas right now they'll be like, Oh, you have to go talk to zoning. Cause you're technically, and you don't have to talk to zoning, but they're going to try and make you run in circles. Cause because no one at the zoning or municipality or the government, whatever little government that is knows what's going on. Right. So there's still all this red tape and it's always that early adopter that yeah. that's going to go through all the bullshit. Right? They still don't even know what a two by four is. Right. Yeah. So, I mean, I, I want to talk a little bit Canadian history now. Right. So we're only getting, getting more expensive. Housing is not going to right. drop down and magically lower itself, right? These are the housing prices. Canada, Toronto, whatever, across the country, Vancouver, Toronto. What's the third one that's most expensive here? Montreal. Montreal, right? They're always going to be at that top 10 list of global places to live yeah. and most expensive, right? So basically in the next 10, 20 years, that's what you're going to see. You're going to see subdivisions or even homes in Toronto. I don't know so much about homes in Toronto because I can't see Forest Hill, Rosedale. I can't see any of those homes adopting this right well, who's to say that you don't know they don't exactly. have a well, no, they don't yeah. have a choice like the reality the, it, it's it'll funny. be the occasional there'll be the occasional larger one that, one that yeah. has a couple units in there and there'll and, be some fighting going and on and the nimbies won't like that yeah, yeah i know it'd be all kinds of i dream of it being called fourplex hill one day 
That's actually pretty <laughs> funny. <laughs> I, I don't I don't see it, but I mean, eventually, if you go down a, a normal neighborhood, right. you could potentially see a, a dwelling on top of a garage that's connected to the main floor garage. For so sure. You've got one dwelling. Now you've For got sure. a garden suite in the back, and then you've split the main dwelling, which is two stories, mm -hmm. and then you probably have a basement of you. So technically speaking, you have five dwellings mm -hmm. on an existing one dwelling structure right now. That's the future of what this is happening. Could be like, well, I think three is what they're aiming for, but but yeah, I mean, like, but even three it, to me is like you just tripled the potential housing stock. Yeah, right? it's true. That's because that person could only afford that one floor, that one unit. So that's where they can't afford. By then, ten years from now, homes are going to be what the average closer to two mil. I mean, I, like you got problems with the Canadian dollar at that point. If that's yeah. that's, I mean, that's the big question. Like, are house prices even going up, or is the value of a dollar just going down? Right. But, if, but you said you want to talk about history. You know, if you go back and look at specifically Toronto and Vancouver, let's just pick the two hottest markets in the country where both the average homes are now Toronto's 1.1 million, Vancouver's 1.2 million. Crazy, right? I'd say, I, and I'm, I'm going to mess this stat up, but I think it's something like 67% in Toronto and over 70% in Vancouver are of the, of the downtown city cores are strictly zoned for single family. And that goes all the way back to planning in like the 1920s where they just literally would not allow multifamily. Now, if you go to certain areas for anyone not in Toronto, this won't make sense, but up Spadina, for instance, and you see all the multifamily, like the missing middle, which is something I do want to talk about before we finish up here. Sure. Um, something that we're super passionate about. We're actually working with a few different companies across the country now in the early stages of providing missing middle housing, which is just fascinating because I've been on calls with people in the Yukon territories, just in the last week, people in the Yukon territories, people out west in both Vancouver and Alberta, uh, people on the east coast in Halifax and Moncton that are literally all telling me, I think it's, I'm hearing the exact same story from every single person across the country. It's that the housing shortage here is so crazy. Missy Middle is, doesn't exist. And I, I need to, I, like these are all construction guys that are, that are doing it, reaching out to us. Um, Dan came in, he had a jacket on that said Land Bank, that's our company that does missing middle funding. So we provide funding and our sweet spots basically anywhere from like two to 50-ish million to build out missing middle housing. And for those that don't know, missing middle is essentially, you know, I think anywhere from three to six stories. Go walk a street in Paris, Rome, Amsterdam, and you'll be pretty that's clear. That's You'll be pretty clear what missing middle housing is. If you walk a street in Toronto, you're either walking downtown in the central business district. We've got towers from 30 to 90 stories. And then from those towers, you go up and you look out and then all of a sudden there's tower, 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 and then it stops and it's just single family homes as far as the eye can see. You have European people coming over here being like, what the hell is this? I get off the subway and I'm in, an, I'm in a suburb that doesn't exist in, in the rest of the world. Yeah. But somehow we've screwed it up so badly zoning in the last 50, 60, 70 years that now we're stuck with this problem. And now we're trying to fix it when we've created this this whole thing. So, the missing middle is is I think that something that uh, that we really all need to, you know, figure out as a country. And and these bills and this legislation that's finally starting to change is is going to I think be the first step there. And I hopefully I think you know in a few years from now we'll start to see new zoning that that is like really incentivizing the missing middle stuff. So you've got a you know you've got the the single family homes and then all of a sudden there is a five story building with maybe a mixed use right there's a barber shop or a cafe or a yoga studio for Mike Holmes or whatever in in the uh, in the main floor and then there's and then there's several floors above it right I agree with you and I love it I would love to see that because but I find that Toronto has lost its corruptive way you know what I mean it's whatever politicians flavor of the week feels like doing right. at that moment and that's why you get a city like toronto that is so messed up like there's such agreements here and then non-agreements here and then you get this confusion yeah. mm -hmm. and then they don't know what to make of it so they don't know how to fix it or how to change it how to it took us 50 years to get an agreement on a subway line that we have the worst subway line in the entire world i used to live at young and eglinton that don't even get me started on the LRT. That was, they were talking about the LRT being finished maybe 15 years ago when I was graduating school. And I was like, okay, awesome. I'll be able to use this in a few years. I just drove past my old neighborhood. I don't think anything's been done. It's, not <laughs> it's finished. crazy. And it's still going to take long. That's what yeah. I mean. There's like, it's just corruption or attached to it to change its mind. And all of a sudden money's being spent and wasted. I would love to see the like, planned cities. Yeah. 
like these other bigger cities that have figured it out, they figured it out way before us. And why didn't we pay attention to them to figure it out? Now we're trying to figure it out now, but we're only doing pieces of it now, right? Yeah. So yeah. it's going to be challenging. For sure, yeah. I mean, it's a, it's a massive problem to solve, and it's the problem to solve. Like you, you have an entire generation coming up that can't afford to live. And where are they going to go? They can't afford to own their own property. I think most people can't even afford to rent. Like the rentership right now. So like what's considered to be affordable by government agencies for housing. And, and it's actually funny because we work with a lot of these government agencies and they, they sort of asked us to stop asking what the word affordable means. Yeah, we literally told where we can't use the word I won't, I won't name because we like, won't but they don't want to have to explain, but, yeah. but they won't, they don't want to have to explain because r- technically afford the amount of income that you should spend on housing is 30% or less for it to be considered affordable. Yeah, but the average person today to own a property in Toronto is supposed to be making 123k. In average. If you if you want to be able to afford a, a house at 30%, you have to make 265 grand in Toronto. So and, and if you if you make the average salary in Toronto, you have you would have to spend or you would it would take you what is it? Like 27 it years to save a down payment. 20, 28 saving, years and, and 30, make the average 35 salary. years what in kid in, in what occupation is making a quarter nobody, million like, dollars. Nobody, like even my buddies who are investment bankers who make obscene amounts of money in the city of Toronto can't afford housing. Like you have a very messed up city where basically you either have to inherit wealth, marry rich, or have already owned, have, have to already be on the property ladder in order to, to be part of the housing economy. Yeah. Otherwise you, you are, you're excluded fully and you're renting forever. And this is like, it's this is how all capitalist economies end up. Like the, in the US it happened very much in a lot of cities. There are 10 years ahead of us. But you look, go look at Europe. Like Europe, the home ownership rate has been in decline for twenty plus years, thirty or sorry, thirty plus years, yeah. and all young people just rent. And they're oh, and and the only place people own homes, like any, urban areas, are all owned by investors. Everybody rents, and then in the suburbs, people have these multi generational homes, where once they've met their mate in the urban area, they go move out to the suburbs with them, and they take over the family house, and the parents live in the basement or whatever. We're headed there. Like yeah. that's just what a late stage capitalist housing model looks like, unfortunately. And, and, and so the question is, do you want to be the investor owner or do you want to be the tenant? And that's the question that we answer like a lot. That's literally what, you know, our, our whole thing is about is how do you, how do you get to the wealth accumulation part to not be, you know, fall victim to a system that's just going through its life cycle. So off mic before we got started, you guys were talking a little bit about, um, you haven't seen lows in 20 years. Like it's been right now. So you guys are still transaction volume, et cetera. Yeah. So 2023 is looking a little different. Well, prices are down. Like we just saw the biggest drop in Canadian in price history, uh, biggest drop in house prices in Canadian history happened basically for the last year. So from in Canadian history. Yeah. Yeah. So from February, 2022 to February, 2023 was the biggest drop we've ever seen in Canadian house house prices. Bigger than, bigger than 1989, bigger than 1981. Now mind you, but it's still not afford. You still can't afford a house. But After. also to proceed that, we also saw some of the biggest increases yeah, yeah. ever in Canadian history through the stupidity of the pandemic and the way that people were spending money and the inflation, and the printing of so money. So is it just leveling off? Yeah, it's basically flat now. Like it is trending up, but it always does in the spring. So the spring market, you see a bit of a bump and then it'll probably, I would say prices will rise till May. I mean, it sounds like I'm being predictive, but this is literally exactly what's going to happen because it happens in any spring market. So Prices will rise until May. They'll fall from May until August, and then they'll rise again in September until October, November, and then they'll fall into Christmas, and then they'll just do that same thing over and over on an upward trajectory in humps. The same way construction has cycles, seasonal cycles, right? Real estate's no different. Uh, Right. I mean, this morning I was talking to another lumber guy, and we were all, if you guys want to build a deck, do it now. Now's the time. (laughs) There is so much supply, and prices are going to drop. That's all I'm saying. Remember when it was lumber and toilet paper that were like the two craziest things to (laughs) get? $12 $12 <laughs> for a two by four, right? That yeah. was just pure capitalistic greed, right? Yeah. Which I wasn't a fan of. Yeah. But I want to basically just try to figure out, uh, we're getting close to wrapping up, but we still got some time. Um, right now for tradespeople, the best option is if you as an individual can't do it, partner up with people that for you sure. work yeah. with and you trust and do it together and then make it happen and then eventually continue doing it together to make it happen again for and sure. again until you can do it on your own. And that's how you're going to grow your... One hundred percent. One of one of the major things that, that I think we talk to investors all the time, dozens of investors a week. Trades and and actually make we we, all, we always talk about value add investing, right? Mm-hmm. So invest, make that property better. 
One of my favorite real estate quotes ever is I don't buy real estate because I think the value is going to go up. I buy real estate because I can make the value go up. Who's going to make it go up? That's a tradesperson that's going to come course. in and do that. Yeah. Either you put in another bathroom, you put in another bedroom, you put in that basement suite, that in-law suite, that detached garage, or you just put in the garage and rent that out, right? There's, there's so many creative ways to do it. So, you know, I've, I've done several transactions in, in real estate where I didn't have any money in and I put a ton of sweat equity in and you know, I was able to leverage my skills as a former PM and, and, you know, just as a, as a laborer to, to be able to work that in and, and then go and convince other investors who had the money and not the time and the, and the a desire to get into the real estate investing world. And what I did is, you know, you're not just going to be a random trades guy and just be like, Hey, look, I know how to, you know, I know electrical come invest in this property with me. No, it's not as simple as that. You still have to know your market. You still have to be able to find good deals. You still have to do all that. So go listen to our podcast. We teach you how to do all yeah, that totally, kind of stuff. Sure. But once you've figured out the basics of investing, which is not tricky, and you have the skills to be able to add value to that property, I can almost guarantee you that you'll be able to find people that want to invest with you because those people are already investing they're just no they just don't have guys like you or girls like you that you know that they need right so trades are the number one thing that that investors need they still need to see the value that they have value exactly is it right so it's funny like a lot of people act like the whole like capital and there's like a couple of like gurus on social media right now trying to sell like oh do real estate deals with other people's money and blah 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 and they're <laughs> selling you some course it's like it's really not that hard like if you're a trade you've probably worked at a rich person's house like you probably can talk to rich people. Like it's not that hard. Have a heartfelt conversation with 10 of the richest people that you know, call them up, set a meeting, be formal about it, take them out for lunch and say, have a package ready. Yeah. Or, or like, or just literally be like, I want to flip houses or I want to, I think bill 23 is going to revolutionize Canadian housing. I want to multiplex random. There's um, this house I know down houses the Houses in Forest Hill. No, like, yeah. but you know what I mean? Like have, an, have a thesis and be like, this is what I want to do. I know the area. I, I, I'm walking distance. I know how, what houses, uh, are worth when they're shitty. I know what I can fix them up to be worth. Go talk to a rich person and be like, would you give me 250 grand to do this? I need you to sign for the mortgage. I need you to buy the house in your name. I'll do all the work. We'll make you, are you're rich. You probably got a good lawyer, draft up the paperwork, make sure you're protected and just have a heartfelt conversation. That's how easy it is to raise capital. Everybody wants to throw money at real estate right now. The thing that most people don't have is somebody who can solve the problems that aren't the money piece. Yeah. And that's where I think like, so if, if trades want to do flipping houses, multiplexing houses, building a, a portfolio, whatever it is, absolutely, like, that's a huge opportunity in the market. So there's right plenty of, even though that we're not sure of what 2023 is going to be all about right now, there's still plenty of opportunities this year? Yeah, we're, I mean, if you just, we've like, been, talk, We've been buying houses nonstop. There's, yeah. a ton of, there's a ton of opportunity. I think there's more opportunity in a year like this than there has been in the last two years because this year, next year, and in the, in the next few years where, you know, we're getting battled by... We're battling inflation. We're battling interest rates. You didn't have to know anything about real estate or trades or anything in the last couple of years to make money in real estate. But now that's gone. Now you do need to know. You need, you need to know information. You need to know people. And the trades have both of those. So again, I think there's a massive opportunity for the trades to be that missing link between the people that Dane's talking about, those rich people that you're, the houses that you're working at. Go have a conversation with them. There's, there's more opportunity now than ever. Yeah, like I think adding units is like is really the big thing. We need housing, but and, and so like multifamily and industrial, like in in Canadian real estate right now, are slam dunk deals. Both just missed opportunities right now because I don't know that many people are actually taking advantage of that right Nobody now. Nobody is. I mean, that's why we're you know out here trying to do the song and dance about yeah. it because like we I, I want to I want to help more and more people build wealth through real estate, and it's really like there hasn't been an opportunity like this. And, and like it's I, I probably sound like every other realtor saying this right now because like. <laughs> everyone's always like, oh, it's the best time to buy and sell real estate. But like, I'm actually a very, very, but you bearish. weren't saying that for the last I'm, three or like, four years. No, like, I mean, if you listen to anything that I've like, it, you can find me on most social media. I'm, I'm exceptionally cynical and bearish about the state of the Canadian economy, the state of the Canadian housing market and real estate. And I still do think that prices will fall probably a little bit over the next two years. But I think it's like, you know, in the big picture, things are going to look pretty well flat if you stretch that out over 10 years. And you look at the 1989 prices dropped right off and then they traded flat for basically like five years. And then it took them until 2002 to get back to their previous peak. Yeah, I think that we're going to see the exact same thing happen. But the thing is, like what that does is it creates opportunity. Everybody wants to buy the bottom of the real estate market. The bottom is going to be five years long. So start looking now. 
you know, don't wait because like you could you could have already flipped a property in in a year or added a unit. Exactly. You could be on your third multiplex that you're yeah. you know that you're adding units to with an investor, building garden suites, whatever it is. Like there's so much opportunity right now to solve the Canadian housing crisis, and it's going to be up to guys like us in this room. High rise developers can only do so much, especially with the municipal the planning departments. Yeah, caught too, yeah. they're caught. You know, concrete construction costs going sky sky high. Um, I think individual homeowners working with tradespeople to to solve the housing crisis is probably the next big theme for like the next decade of, of ca Canadian real estate. So basically, the two of you guys, any tradesperson contact you guys, and then yeah, call us. Well, oh, yeah, you. just yeah, get the ball to. rolling from there, yeah. right? Yeah. Yeah. yeah, like we can figure out a way to help you with real estate it's, if it's buying properties to flip or to to uh, to multiplex them, or if you want to build a, a portfolio of an, an investment portfolio, or if you want to do the the um, industrial thing that we we mentioned, like happy to to help that's people. That's the one that's appealing to me. Man. It's really like, cool, yeah, right? It's sense. cool, and like yeah. nobody is, and and the thing is, like, there's such a dislocation. Like, <laughs> if you look at. Uh, a small industrial unit in like Newmarket, as an example, versus a house in Newmarket. A small industrial unit would rent for five thousand dollars a month. It's going to cost you three hundred grand to buy that. I think the last time we looked at them, they're like three hundred grand. That's crazy. And it'll rent for five grand a month. There's condo fees, but still, um, just rough math here. It's, if you're to buy a house that will make five grand a month, it's going to cost you one point two mil. So at for least, yeah. for so for four what four times the price basically. Right. Even and, if even if they're and you're not dealing with the family that's moving in, you're dealing with yeah, a contractor tenant, yeah. that's moving in. He doesn't want to hear from you. He's hey, like this is broken. Okay, well, it was a contract. He's probably going to fix, fix it. it. You know, you're not getting the call, hey, the light's not working. Like I like the calls you get, you get as a as a residential landlord. Yeah. You know, I've had to send people in to teach people how to use a washer dryer. Like it's just ridiculous, right? So the B to B the B unfortunately the B to B <laughs> aspect of it is is a huge thing as well. Yeah. Yeah, and like somebody doesn't pay the rent, you lock the door, right? Like that's it. In, you just, you're just hope you're property. not renting to a locksmith, I guess. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. or someone with a big drill. <laughs> yeah, Nick and Dan. All right, we're getting close to the end here. Thanks so much, uh, Canadian Real Estate uh, Investor Podcast. Uh, how many shows you guys have? We just released our. Well, we just yeah. eighty-one tomorrow. Oh, look, you climb in there, eh? Yeah, it's we crazy. do two a week, and then yeah, yeah. it's. Uh, I think, we're, I think we're the the biggest real estate podcast in Canada. We're the biggest real estate podcast and third biggest business one as well. Not to not to brag, but you got to pump your own tires sometimes. Listen, I'm the most listened to construction podcast in the entire world. That's what I tell everybody. Love it. <laughs> there we go. <laughs> Nick Dothill at LandBankAdvisors.ca and Daniel Fush, right? Yep. Fush? I want to make sure I pronounce that. That's better than most people's attempts. Why do they say it? I get the F word a lot. Oh, I don't doubt that one, man. Uh, Fosh, F-O-C-H, at landadvisors.ca. Reach him out on Instagram, on Twitter, my buddy Nick 89 and also Daniel hyphenated Fosh, and then uh, my buddy Nick on Instagram for Nick. Uh, anything last minutes before we get into the 12 questions? Uh oh I think we shared a bunch of stuff. Yeah. Bring up good. yoga pants with Mike Jr. if you want, man. <laughs> <laughs> I'm waiting for his divorce to happen, see how he's going to fall apart. That would be interesting. <laughs> no, comment. I'm not wishing it, but I'm not. I'm waiting for it. Um, thanks so much, guys. This is actually really cool, man. Seriously, yeah. Thanks for having. I've us had a, I've had other real estate mortgage brokers on the show, and and they've said what they've said. You know what I mean? They like they, buy now, buy now, buy now. But you guys have shed new light on certain key things, yeah. which is really valuable. I would right? say don't buy now, as long as this episode doesn't come out before like May. Like when is this coming? Uh, it's going to probably come up the week after next. Yeah, right? I would say buy this summer. Right, by this like summer, by this summer or, or like now. or this or this Christmas, yeah. Like understand the seasonal flows. Like do not buy in in the uh, high, yeah, March, April, or May of any year. Like you, you can literally see prices do they do humps. How long have you guys been in the game? I've been in real estate for fifteen years. Yeah, I've been in construction and real estate for for ten, but just on the mortgage side for going on three now. But been in the business and construction real estate world for for a decade. It's fun, huh? Yeah, I love it. Wouldn't wouldn't do anything else. I would I would probably be like a a machinery operator actually. But well, we'll get into that in yeah. twelve questions here, right, gentlemen? Every time I see like a piece of machinery drive by, I just wonder if I made the right life choice. <laughs> Honestly. <laughs> All right, ready for this? Yeah. You guys have no idea what these questions no. are. Because, no, I mean, exciting. we were communicating so fast through DMs, and I normally I send them to That's everybody, all good. right? So uh, there's no right or wrong. What is your favorite construction word? Change order. <laughs> That's your favorite construction one? Sorry, least favorite or? <laughs> favorite. The next question is least favorite. Oh, I don't know. Maybe LVL. Is that a word? Yeah. Acronyms count? Yeah. Acronyms count. You're going to keep your change order? Yeah, I'll keep it. Least favorite construction word. I, I'm going to keep it that because I saw a guy, a yacht in Miami, in 
the name of the yacht was changed. No, was really? it a son of a bitch? <laughs> wow, he took a negative into a positive. That's it, yeah. Uh, least favorite construction word. Mine would probably be mortar. Mortar? Yeah, man, I just have had so much bad experience tiling. I'll never, I don't think I'll ever tile again. <laughs> it's one of those things where, like, I, you, you always try and DIY, have your friend over with the trade that can, like, you, you just be their helper, right? You got your friend, like, you know, the, the guy who actually knows what they're doing, and you kind of just, like, end up handing them tools because you don't have a clue what you're doing. <laughs> but mortar is, is one that I've had too many bad experiences with. Deficiencies. What turns you on in construction, gentlemen? Uh, creating from, from start to finish, being able to look at something in, on paper and then see it in real life. I love, love that. Always have played with a lot of Lego as a kid. Adding units. <laughs> what turns you off in construction? Uh, the fact that the schedule is usually wrong. <laughs> Never right. <laughs> the cost of diesel fuel. Yeah, why is it more? I have no idea. Like, why is it more? I've never because understood that. It, well, it never was, like, never historically. Was. But, and then we got into COVID and, like, the supply dislocation, whatever. But yeah, I more, guess that's more people why. purchase diesel vehicles. Yeah. Uh, favorite curse word? I don't know. It's <laughs> <Just> too many. <laughs> you got to pick one. Probably, probably fuck, I think. Yeah, I'll, I'll stick with fuck. Favorite vehicle in the entire world? Uh, 2500 HD Denali. I'm gonna go like old. I'm a uh, my dad's Italian. I've been watching Ferrari race forever. I'm gonna go probably old uh, Ferrari Testarossa. If we're doing like midlife crisis cars, probably C7 Corvette. <laughs> okay, that's not midlife. That's like midlife goal <laughs> car. Testarossa is a beautiful. No, car. No, Testarossa is beautiful. What's wrong with you, man? They don't <laughs> the, that was the, that was the first cheese wedge. Like <laughs> honestly, it was there, yeah, right? Yeah, that yeah. was that Biggest created that design. Ass ever. I love that whole era. Right? Yeah, I love it's that whole beautiful. era of Ferraris. What's your least favorite vehicle? Pontiac Aztec. Great car. Was that <laughs> wall, ugly wall horror? Set? I was literally voted the ugliest car ever. Ever made sure, it. Yeah. It sure. fell down every, like, hit every bro. Is so that what bad. Walt drives in Breaking Bad? I think so. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> yes, it is. I don't know. I don't really have uh, my old Duramax was pretty bad. It just no, but that thing was awesome. So many times. <laughs> what construction sound or noise do you guys love? Uh,. The impact drill that uh, I hear every morning on the condo being built next door. <laughs> you can hear it all the way? Really? <laughs> well, concrete's basically a sound yeah. chamber, right? Yeah. So, mm. I don't know. Probably like that click when a tape gets like finally back. You know, like when you unroll it. Oh, the it tape comes measure. Back. Yeah, 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 like yeah. when oh, it comes back after one. like 25 feet and it's just like <laughs> that little, that final yeah. sheathing. That's a good yeah. one. Before it hits you in the and eye. you feel it in the hand. Yeah. <laughs> and you have your <laughs> the tip of your finger in there. What's your least, or sorry, what construction sound or noise do you hate? Probably the that same, same impact drill. I've yeah, I think like anything breaking concrete is just the worst. Yeah. It's really because you feel it, right? And it's the, the sound that you feel. The dust, yeah, concrete just reverbs. Yeah. What profession other than your own would you guys like to attempt one day? I would just be operating like a, a machine, like an excavator for sure. I've like I thought I think every day about just quitting my job and buying an excavator. <laughs> what which one? I don't know, whatever. Like pro I'd probably just buy a mini. I already have like the the dump trailer, so I'd probably just buy a mini and like dig people like separate entrances for their <laughs> just to, just dig <laughs> holes. Yeah, like I'd just be digging like entrances for basement apartments. Knock or on the door yeah. and go, can I just yeah, dig a yeah, hole? I, yeah, you want a pond? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I don't know. No, I, I'm just too slow. But like, but uh, but you I just, just love enjoy it. using. Yeah, it. I like it. Yeah. It's fun. I don't know. Yeah, I don't know. Honestly, like I I, I really love everything I do right now. I I, I do love the outdoors. So, I don't know, park ranger. In the in some like badass national park somewhere, what profession would you guys not like to do? How long do we have for this? Top three, whatever doesn't matter. The worst one. I I would just not want to do any job that I hate. Like I think it's sad to see people Waste. not. Yeah, yeah, like just like I mean, you, yeah, you just like you live once, like, and you spend like what sixty percent of your waking life like working like fucking do something you want to do seriously yeah. like and if you hate it like find some most people just don't know what they like but i would just anything that i didn't like like i used to work in the public sector and like it was just people wishing like they all had calendars counting down to their retirement date i'm like you're literally wishing your life away right now like you're just and what are you going to do when you retire more nothing they're the least receptive people when it comes to jokes. Yeah. And when you go to any kind of building office and you're trying to make a joke just to liven them up, and, and it could be their best joke of the day, and you don't get anything from them, man. I and mean, you just look at them going, life's just been sucked from you, eh? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, honestly, I don't even think I have a good answer for that. I've I've 
done a lot of trying different things in my life and a lot of failing. Um, I can comfortably say don't spend any time, any more than six to 12 months in something you don't like. Give everything, give everything your all because you'll find passion in like the weirdest things sometimes. But um, yeah, I just don't, if you hate what you're doing, get the fuck out of there. I agree. Last question. If heaven exists, what would you guys like to hear God say when you arrive at the pearly gates? I like him to sing me that song I sung in my opening. <laughs> I don't know. Honestly, that's a good question. Um, We've been expecting you. Yeah. Know. <laughs> yeah. Did somebody mess up? Change order. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Jamin, thank you so much. Everyone, check out their podcast, Canadian Real Estate Investor Podcast. Uh, find it everywhere, right? You guys are all on yeah, channels with that. And then reach out to them at their emails, man. Nick.hill at landbankadvisors.ca and daniel.fush at landbankadvisors.ca. And... Uh, that's it, man. Pleasure. Yeah, I mean, let's do some real estate. Thanks deal. so much, man. Let's make some trades for people rich us. in real estate. Yeah. yeah. All right, cool. Thank you. Angelie, we're out of here. <laughs>